There are no good ships in Hoseki no Kuni, only bad ones and ones that have yet to develop into bad ones. There is no better day like today to discuss how terrible all these ships are on Valentine's Day, and starting with the one that starts it all, Cinnabar and Foss. I am not a huge shipper, so it surprised me when I watched the anime and at the end of it I kind of did ship Cinnabar and Foss. I wasn't sure if they would ever end up in a partnership, but I at least thought that they would become better friends throughout the series, and eh, that did not happen. Cinnabar and Foss's relationship is integral to the story of Hoseki no Kuni, and I love the unexpected expectations of setting up their relationship as something that will develop throughout the story, and it's really something that turns into the main conflict. The reason why the destruction of Cinnabar and Foss's relationship hurts so much is because we could all see, as fans, how their relationship could have been wonderful. As friends or as more, it doesn't really matter. What mattered was that Foss cared for Cinnabar and was the only one willing to reach out to them, and Cinnabar desired their help and closeness as a friend, but because of their lack of communication issues and all the other things that were happening in the story, it just didn't happen. It wasn't until I compiled every single scene Cinnabar has seen for another video I'm creating that I realized just how the dialogue between Cinnabar and Foss really shows how much they care for each other, but also shows the problems in causing them to be distant. I think the main problem is that Foss refused to look at what Cinnabar actually needed, which was them as a friend, and instead saw it as a transactional thing where Foss only felt like they could talk to Cinnabar if they had made progress in finding them a job and not as a friend or going to them with their troubles or anything. Meanwhile, Cinnabar did similarly didn't reach out to anybody, didn't try to seek Foss out. Cinnabar puts up a mask of what they're feeling and refuses to elaborate on what they're thinking or what they want. Even though Cinnabar and Foss are quite similar in their place in society and their hardness level and a lot of other things that they have similarities in, they're also contrasting in viewpoints. Physically, they're the same in position, in rank, in hardness and all that, but mentally they're very different. Cinnabar is comfortable taking up an unfulfilling role as long as they give the illusion of contributing to society, whereas Foss refuses to take a role that they do not believe suits them. Cinnabar chose one job and stuck with it to, because they don't want to go to the unknown of making change or having something different, whereas Foss is the one who makes change in the story. Foss is unsatisfied with things and will do anything to change them. Cinnabar is also unsatisfied with things, but is worried that change will make things worse. We see Cinnabar always make a goopy version of original Foss with the Mercury that they have, and that shows that they really value Foss in their original form and how they were. Even though everyone seemed to value Foss more as they changed, I think Cinnabar was the opposite. As Foss changed, they became more concerned and more saddened by Foss's change because they remembered Foss as their original self and loved Foss as their original self. It's honestly why I think Cinnabar rejected to go to the moon with Foss is because they looked at Foss in the eyes and realized that this wasn't the same person that they cared for, that cared for them. They realized that what Foss originally was doing as a selfless act to help them became a selfish act for Foss to fulfill their own need for comfort on the moon and not for what Cinnabar needed or what was best for Cinnabar. There's a point in Hoseki no Kuni, I forgot which chapter this is, where Foss goes and talks with Cinnabar. And after they talk, Foss says, I'm glad that Cinnabar hasn't changed. Meanwhile, Foss has changed significantly since then. I believe this was Winter Foss. Um, so Lapis's head wasn't on them yet, but if I'm remembering wrong and Lapis's head was on them, that, that just makes that statement even worse, because it shows that Foss values the comfortability that Cinnabar is still the same as they were before, but they don't realize how that's destructive to Cinnabar. Cinnabar feels the same about them, but in contrast, Foss has changed significantly, and every time Cinnabar sees Foss, there, something's different about them, whether it be their arms or their hair or their legs. And I believe there's not even three times in a row where Foss is visibly the same to Cinnabar. Foss changing throughout the series actually shows how Foss is a perfect foil to Cinnabar, but also started as their parallel. And it's interesting to see how that changed, because they started in the same place, but they ended in completely different places. Cinnabar actually rejecting Foss to go to the moon, despite Foss telling them that they could remove their mercury, kind of reminds me of Pebble in the chapter, whatever chapter Pebble appears in, because Foss tells them that they can improve them in the way that Foss views an improvement, but Pebble denies it because Pebble is content as they are. I'm not saying that Cinnabar was content as they are in that moment, but I believed how Cinnabar saw how the changes that Foss had done that was supposedly an improvement in quotes 
changed Foss so significantly that Cinnabar didn't see them as the same person. And I bet Cinnabar didn't want the same thing to happen to them. The mercury that Cinnabar has is a huge part about them. And by removing it, of course, they'd be better, but would they be the same person? And I bet that were the thoughts that Cinnabar was going through. Another thing is Cinnabar would love to be accepted with the mercury, which happens later on, but they would rather be accepted as they are versus changing themselves to become more accepted, which is what Foss does. And it just shows how much they're a foil relationship. I believe this is why their relationship destructed so much because of these key differences in how they view things and the fact that they couldn't communicate with each other and tell each other what they needed to become better friends and move forward. What's really sad is that Foss was the only one who valued Cinnabar from the beginning for them, for as they are. But as time went on, that value that Foss saw in Cinnabar was the only thing they cared about. And that's what Foss was changed into. The only reason that people cared about Foss after they changed themselves is because of their changes. Their value was solely in their utility and not for them as a person. Foss was the first one to recognize that Cinnabar is valuable for as they are, even though they do have problems to them, which is like the Mercury. But it isn't until Foss becomes a problem that the others in the society start to view Cinnabar as more valuable, but it's because of what they can bring to the table. Hoseki no Kuni is a little bit of a commentary on how your worth in a society depicts how you're valued. And this is why Foss speaks so derogatory to Cinnabar in their final moments, because Cinnabar even knows that the reason that the characters are caring for them is because of their value. And both Cinnabar and Foss see that, but they see it differently. Cinnabar is happy to provide value to the people that care for them, whereas Foss sees it as being used and not being cared for. And I think this is because Cinnabar is being valued for the person they've always been, and Foss is being valued for the person they changed to be, which has caused them so much pain, but they don't care about Foss's pain. They only care about how they're useful to them. I believe Cinnabar becomes apathetic to Foss in the end for the same reason that Foss becomes apathetic to Cinnabar in the end. It's because they can't see the person they originally cared for and loved in the person that stands before them. Cinnabar doesn't see the pure Foss that simply wanted to help Cinnabar because they cared for them so much, and Foss doesn't see the person that they wanted to help because Cinnabar no longer seeks validation from the group because they have that, whereas Foss still seeks validation because they don't have that. The reason Foss destroys the gem society is because they no longer feel comfortable with it existing because they have never been validated by that and they believe that they'll just discard anything that they don't value, which is what eventually happens to Foss and what they want to prevent in the future. And that's why they do the same thing to them as what they did to Foss. They both didn't know it, but their love was conditional on if the person would change or not. And they changed. Cinnabar changed less, but they both changed in their own eyes. Their idea with them no longer matched reality. I did not expect to talk that long about Cinnabar and Foss because I could make that into another video, but alas. Next is the ship Antark in Foss, which is very short-lived, at least in the manga. Nevertheless, it is a very impactful ship in the story as well because Foss's admiration of Antark is the next thing that drives the plot. And it shows that the relationships that Foss has really made a significance in the story and the lack of relationship that Foss started and ended with is what the story is about. Like Cinnabar, Antark was also a lonely gem in the fact that they were separated by their job as well, but also by their hardness level and the weird makeup of their body, which is again also like Cinnabar, um, because they are isolated to the winter because they can only exist basically in the winter. I remember hearing some people say that they believed that Antark's kindness to Foss, like they were a little harsh on Foss, but you know, the fact that they did take them under, under their wing in like a mentorship sort of relationship wasn't unique to Foss, as if it was something that Antark would do for any gem with just how they are personality-wise. I'm not quite sure about that. I think that is probably more up to interpretation. Some people were saying that the closeness that Foss felt with Antark wasn't subjected to just them, like saying that Antark would do that for any gem who they seem as protective and a partner to them, especially because they have never had one before. And I believe it was something that Antark did appreciate with having someone to share winter duty with, even though he's just like Cinnabar, you know, <laughs> sued and a bit. But it is interesting to think about how would Antark deal the same way if it was another gem, or was the bond that Antark and Foss shared unique, you know? This is also the first real partnership that Foss has ever had. Um, I know that we stated like Cinnabar and Foss, but they never really became like partners. I would say Antark and Ghost and Karen Gorm all became sort of Foss's partners and people that they actually lost. Whereas 
Cinnabar, you know, was always at a distance for Foss. Antark is the first person that Foss really has who be was a partner to them in the first time they've ever experienced the loss of a partner. Because, of course, I bet that all the gems are sad when someone is lost, but all the gems besides Foss get over Antark's death, in quotes, quite quickly. And I believe it's usually like this. Only the gems who are really close to someone uh, feel the pain of grief when they're gone. The others are saddened that they lost someone, but they, since they never really knew them, it's not something they really feel. I think that Antark really did care for Foss um, in a protective, like kind of like older sibling way, which they are. But I believe Foss really attached themselves to Antark because they never had someone do what Antark did for them. They never had a mentor. They never had someone to lead them through life, basically. And they never had someone take an interest in them in progressing them and making them better, which Antark really pushed Foss to get better, which is what they wanted to do. I believe the number was 28 days that Foss was with Antark. And considering Foss is probably over 300 years old, it's incredible the bond that was able to be formed in just that short amount of time for Foss's lifespan. And it also just really shows that Antark was the first partner that Foss really had because they got so attached to them and we had never heard of Foss doing that to anyone in the past. And it just shows that all the other gems didn't really take an interest in Foss in the same way Antark had to do during winter. Also, because Foss thinks so lowly of himself, the fact that Antark decided to do this, Foss sees them as so kind and courageous and strong, and they constantly compliment Antark after they were taken to the moon, but constantly put down themselves by doing that. Foss wants to replicate Antark after they're gone to show how much they cared for them, but by doing that, it also puts down themselves, and it also reminds them that they aren't the person that they want to be because they wanted to be like Antark. But they only knew Antark for 28 days. They didn't know how Antark probably also messes up sometimes, how Antark is also just a gem uh, and not someone who is incredible that Foss puts them on this pedestal. It's because of this limited perspective that Foss has on Antark that they're able to put Antark on this pe pedestal. I bet if Foss had a longer time with Antark, it would have hurt more, yes, but they probably wouldn't have had this idealized vision of what Antark was because they had to make inferences on the rest of Antark's personality that they didn't get to see in those 28 days. And Foss will assume the better of someone that they look up to and assume the worst of themselves. And that's what's really interesting about the relationship. Antark and Foss's relationship would have also probably been a good one. And that's probably why Acmea also cut it short. And it's be due to this distance and this long time, Foss doesn't even get to see Antark when Antark gets revived. That is how their relationship decayed, which honestly is better than all the other ways the relationships decayed but it's similar to how ghost's relationship with foss decayed as well just with ghost also being taken up by the moon this will probably be a smaller section because there really is only like a couple chapters ghost is with foss but it's the same with antark which is really interesting ghost's relationship with foss is probably the most unhealthy if you count the part where they are also controlling karen gorm because it is so not good to see your previous partner in someone else and sort of imprint that on them and to care for someone only because they remind you of someone else. At first, I believe Ghost saw Foss as a replacement for Lapis, and eventually Foss saw Karen Gorm as the replacement for Antark. And I believe this trauma bonding of trying to be each other's expectations of their previous partner was really not the healthiest. The only positive thing that I can say about Ghost and Foss's relationship is Ghost genuinely wanted to help Foss, but, you know, that did come with the caveat of them reminding them of someone that they once loved. But Ghost was a full-on cheerleader and supporter for what Foss wanted to do and really helps them research and all that stuff because they genuinely cared to help with Foss's goal. Whereas Cinnabar stepped back and did not help Foss with what they wanted to do, and Antark sort of helped only as an obligation to Foss to become like a winter gem. Ghost was there to say yes to anything that Foss wanted to do and would not question or behave harshly if Foss did something that they thought would not be good otherwise. And I believe this is a reflection for the conditioning that maybe we can with Lapis and Ghost's relationship. It could also set up the expectation that Ghost believes that Karen Gorm should do exactly what they say because that's what they do with Lapis. We don't know much about Lapis, and we know even less about Lapis and Ghost's relationship, but just with how Foss is with Antark, Ghost only speaks highly of Lapis and doesn't say anything negative about them. Karen Gorm actually says some negative stuff about Lapis, which is interesting, but Ghost never says anything like that. 
in the same way that Foss idolized Antark, Ghost idolized Lapis and saw them as the ideal partner. And I bet that Lapis was also Ghost's first partner as well. Euclid was the one who mentioned that Lapis was seemed very manipulative, which is something we see in Foss later that Foss sort of gained. But that probably carried over into Ghost and Karen Gorm's relationship with Lapis. And so it's interesting that Ghost probably doesn't say anything negative about Lapis because Lapis probably manipulated them to see them as an authority figure and someone they look up to and something they do anything for. That's why Ghost is so readily happy to help Foss and doesn't talk back to them because Ghost has probably been conditioned by Lapis to be more of a servant role. And I bet that Ghost probably took this method and probably used it with Karen Gorm as well. And that's why Karen Gorm is, would go as far as to remove their head to save Foss, even though I bet Karen Gorm didn't want to do that, but because Ghost insists on it and Karen Gorm must follow because that's how Karen Gorm has been conditioned as well. And it's just this cycle of conditioning with Lapis conditioning Ghost, which conditions Karen Gorm, and then Ghost conditioning Karen Gorm, and that just, you know, gets to Karen Gorm's relationship with Foss. It's really Ghost and Karen Gorm before the moon, you know? And so it's kind of hard because the lines are blurred. But th like when I said that Ghost is the most unhealthiest relationship, that carries over to Karen Gorm's unhealthy relationship with Foss as well. Because of course, Karen Gorm reminds Foss so much as Antark that Karen Gorm sees this as a means to mimic Antark as much as possible to help Foss. <laughs> but it doesn't really help and it just makes the trauma worse. I really did think that Karen Gorm and Foss's relationship was good at the beginning, you know, until the moon. But once it was pointed out to me that they both see their previous partners in them, I started to realize how incredibly unhealthy that is to have your next partner basically replace your ex. And yeah, um, it was really funny because when one of my friends was reading uh, the Hoseki no Kuni manga, they exclaimed like why Ghost was so clingy and like would do anything for Boss um, or Karen Gorm, you know, the mix. And I was like, oh, it's because, you know, they have the head of Lapis. Like, that's why. And they said, like, just because I have the head of your dead ex doesn't mean, and we just started bursting out laughing, because it's just such a ridiculous situation. Situation, Man, I can't speak. Anyway, in gist, that part of their relationship was incredibly unhealthy for them to use the other person as a means to fulfill their grief of not having someone else. And their goal was to get the person that they cared for back and... They would do anything for that goal and their determination to do that wasn't really love as it was obsession to complete something kind of like what rutile had like we'll talk about this more in that section but like with rutile's obsession to fix paparaja became greater than their care for them just being there i believe because foss and karen gorm slash ghost never really developed into a healthy love for one another was because of the fact that they had this image of someone else that they imprinted onto the other person, and they never really cared for them as they were. That's why Karen Gorm decided to act like Antark, and even go as far as to ask Acnea to imprint Ac Antark's substances on them so that they could be Antark, basically. And it's really interesting, because that's exactly how it used to be with Ghost. They asked Acnea to bring them back to the way they were with Ghost with, instead of Ghost of being Antark. And this is because of Karen Gorm's issues that I'm going to go into multiple videos in depth about because Karen Gorm is such a deeply flawed character. But it's really interesting because I would say that there's actually the least amount of care in Karen Gorm and Foss's relationship now because it was built on false expectations. You know, Cinnabar cared for Foss as they were at the beginning. Antark cared for Foss in the sense of a younger sibling, sort of, and like I just accepted them for their fumbles and bumbles. Foss and Karen Gorm only accepted each other in the eyes that they were like someone that they cared about, but they don't actually see the actual person that each one of them are, and that's why their relationship is just absolute crap. <laughs> and that brings us on to one of the next worst ships in this entire series, uh, Bort and Daya. But before we get to that, you have almost been listening to this video for almost 20 minutes, and because of that, I believe that you probably might are interested in Hoseki no Kuni. And if you are interested in Hoseki no Kuni, I got news for you. I am making a lot of videos on Hoseki no Kuni and already have a lot of an ex existing videos on Hoseki no Kuni. So please subscribe if you would like to see more or if you really like my content and you will get notified for that. 
You can also join my Discord server if you're interested in knowing what videos I'm working on, or if you want to give me video suggestions, there's a channel for that. So please go down to the description of this video and check out the Discord server. There's also a Buy Me a Coffee link down there if you would like to donate and fund the creation of these videos. Now on to the toxic mess that is Bort and Daya. <laughs> there are problems with both of these characters, but let's start with Bort because it'll be a shorter list. <laughs> Bort's problems is that they're very harsh and quick to judge, and which in the concept of battling, it's not a bad thing, but people often take their critiques as harsh criticism and even insults, and that's why they seem so harsh and jagged, you know, because of how they are. We see how this affects Daya, Zurichon, and Foss um, with Bort's harshness and quick to draw lines when they have the problem that Foss creates later. And it shows that Bort is very critical, it thinks very illogically, and isn't the heir to give so much sympathy towards others or to understand what they're coming from. They just state their opinion and that's what's that. They also state things more as facts and as definites. And they're the ones that cause the gems to split off from Foss completely during the reconstruction of their society. And this affects Daya because Daya has been with Bort for so long that they now have an internal, internal Bort voice like in them, basically. And we see that because they never forget about Bort. They had been with Bort with so long and Bort had constantly criticized them and didn't want them to do, do what they were meant to do, which was fight. And it kind of is the thing of like, you know, Bort stealing their thunder, which is why Daya is incredibly jealous. And Daya feels in a worse place, even though they are a diamond and are equally capable of fighting, because Bort has stolen their thunder. And the reason why Daya says that they wish that they were the only diamond around is because Bort feels like a replacement, and now Daya feels useless because of that. Someone actually pointed out in one of the comment sections of my videos that Foss's comments towards Daya might be more patronizing than Foss meant them to be as like compliments and all that, just because the aspects that Foss was complimenting Daya on do not match Bort's aspects of what makes a diamond. And Daya has ingrained what Bort sees as a good diamond in their view, and because of that, they think Foss complimenting them on how they are just the opposite of Bort makes Daya mad because they believe that they need to fit Bort's standards and they believe that their uniqueness and what makes them different is bad. Daya also encourages Foss to change because Foss and Daya have similar feelings of insecurity about their place in society, even though they are on opposite sides of the hardness scale, which is really interesting to see that the feelings that Foss and Daya feel can happen anywhere on the hardness scale because it's not about their hardness or what their value is to society, it's the way they view it, which is really interesting. The reason why Daya and Bort's relationship is so toxic is because all of their traits work against each other in the relationship. Both their personalities are not good for the way that they both conduct their lives, and the fact that Daya is older than Bort also makes Daya feel even worse because Daya feels like they should outshine Bort just because they're the older sibling. So it makes them feel even more inferior to be outclassed by someone with less experience than they are. And they talk about how Bort is constantly changing and constantly improvement. And this is out of jealousy at the fact that Bort is progressing and they are the same. And it makes them angry and want to change. And that's why they encourage that for Foss. Daya also has such a transactional view of relationships as well. We actually only hear this when Foss runs away and Daya comes to comfort Foss after being yelled at and Daya says something along the lines, I don't have the manga in front of me, that like people aren't going to like you if you don't like be nice to them or put on a face or something like that. Like Daya says like you have to be nice to people and do things for them in order for them to do that to you and for like Congo to not get mad basically. And it shows that this is how Daya views relationships. And Daya not being able to contribute as much as they should gives them the fear and anxiety that people will ostracize them. I could be reading too much into that because, you know, I'm the over-analysis person, but it's very interesting how their characters really show that. Anyway, you didn't need a speech to tell you that Daya and Bort's relationship is really toxic. <laughs> In contrast, I think this next shift Bart and Cinnabar is actually probably one of the healthier like main ships I've seen in the community and again that could just be because it doesn't get enough screen time to be bad but Bort and Cinnabar actually mesh well personality wise simply because Bort's uh, straightforwardness that Foss lacks is something that 
Cinnabar really needs. And the fact that Bort is so quick to judge and understand things, it was Bort who next saw the usefulness of Cinnabar and was able to incorporate them more into society. We also see in the art books that Bort and Cinnabar hang out, like when Cinnabar is just sitting there while Bort is showing Cinnabar like what they taught the jellyfish and that's pretty cute. But I also think that's also due to Bort's development because I think Bort did develop like in the years that we didn't see them to be less like battle like geek, you know, they explain that too. Uh, and to be I, a little kinder to people, I think that Bort has developed in that way because they are still tactical and thinking and all that stuff, but it's less in a harsher way. And because they're dealing with jellyfish now instead of other gems, they're not putting anyone down with their critiques. And so I think it's probably a healthy inner environment for them. And I think that's why Cinnabar and Bort's relationship kind of grows to be a healthier or better one is simply because of that. But again, we don't really get enough screen time for us to say that it is really good or bad, but I do think that they became such better friends, which is very nice to see. Another thing that's interesting to note is Cinnabar and Daya are the same age. And so it's interesting to see how toxic Daya and Bort's relationship is. And then Bort's relationship with Cinnabar, who's of the same age as Daya, is still a good one. And so it shows that like the age dynamics isn't really a part of Cinnabar and Bort's relationship, but it is a part of Bort and Daya's. I think just because Daya really feels like they have to be the older sibling in the relationship, causing Daya to have such negative feelings because of the way Bort shines, whereas Bort and Cinnabar see each other as more as equals. And I think that's because they don't really put an emphasis on their birth year or anything, because it's really interesting because Daya is the one who brings up that Cinnabar and them are the same age, whereas Cinnabar never really brings up like age in general. It's again stated that Cinnabar and Daya are the same age when it's brought up in the like meeting the Earth Gems have at some point, but again, Cinnabar doesn't really give relation to it, whereas Daya really exclaimed that like the fact that they were the same age when they first met, we see them first meet in the manga, is like really big. Like, oh, come on, we're the same age. We should be more connected. And I think that it shows that Daya is more connected on like the same year. And this is a Korean thing, so I'm not sure if it really relates to Japanese culture, but in Korea, they have the Asian honorifics for only if, uh, you know, you're a year older or a year younger. And if you're of the same age, it's just assumed that you're automatically friends because you're born the same year. Um, this is, I'm not sure if this is a concept in other Asian cultures as well. I heard it specifically for Korea, but I believe that's like that in other Asian cultures as well, because um, in the Philippines, you use Manong or Ate or Koya. Um, sorry, jump scare to all my 3.9% Filipino viewers. Uh, in Korea, you use, I don't know Korean that well. In Japan, you use uh, Ani, Ane. We also know that Bort is younger because Bort says Onisan to Daya, which is the honorific for older brother, which shows the rank that Daya is older and should be respected with Onisan, that sort of language. So considering that Daya and Cinnabar were born the same year, possibly around the same time as well, means that they don't need to use honorifics with one another, which makes them closer as like friends is kind of what the Korean thing is, is that like if you're the same year you're of the friends. Again, I don't know if that's specific to Korean. My I don't know how many of you are Korean watching this. My Korean viewers used to let me know if that's accurate. Uh, and if you are of Asian descent, let me know if that's similar in your culture as well. Cause I, that is a question that I've never thought of with my own culture, because I'm half Filipino, is if you use uh honorifics with people who like are around at the same year. I assume even if it's like a month you use the honorific. Anyway, that was a bit of a tangent. We're now talking about the ship Daya in Cinnabar, which I've seen some people ship. Of course, that could be anime only is because, yeah, that doesn't really happen uh, once you think manga wise. But um, the main thing that people are is that they are the same year and the first interaction with, is it the only interaction with Daya in Cinnabar? Like they actually talk, the one with the snail where Ventricose is with them. That might be the only one because I can't think of another. Um, I guess Daya comes first to look for Foss. And then Daya comes later with ventricosis. And I think that's the only time they talk. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. But I know that some people from those conversations like ship them a bit. And the main thing I can see is because of the year thing, like that Daya being really upfront with like, we're the same year, we should be like besties is kind of like why I can see why some people might ship them just because of Daya's assertiveness. But I feel like Daya was also like, hey, I could tell that you really like Foss because you talk about them all the time. Um, I don't know. Like, because we only have, like, two scenes with Daya and Cinnabar. I don't know, like, the problems that come out of their relationship. I think 
we've already talked about all of Daya's problems and we've talked about Cinnabar's problems. And I feel like the fact that Cinnabar is really quiet might also annoy Daya as well because Bort is also really quiet. Like, did, I, I wonder, like, introvert, extrovert thing. If you are one of those people that ships Cinnabar and Daya, uh, leave in the comments your thoughts about that ship because I don't understand it that well other than them being of the same year, you know? Anyway, time for the fan favorite ship, Rutile and Pad Baracha. Uh, didn't that turn out so well? <laughs> Technically, this is probably the only ship that is confirmed, besides the last one. Um, even though we don't get as big of a confirmation, um, we get to see in the, like, last Lunarian manga with Pad Paracha in the background as Rutile talks about, like, uh, how they can relate to their client talking about, like, problems with their partner. And so I think that kind of implies that, like, they did patch things up eventually and are sort of together at the end of the manga. Um, but we don't know much about what actually happened to their relationship after that. I probably need to make a whole separate video on Rutile and Paparucha's relationship alone because there's so much to unpack there. But the gist of it is basically that the unhealthiness stems from Rutile and their obsession with bringing back Paparucha, which is at first seen as a sign of like great love that Rutile has, the fact that they dedicate their life to it. But they had been doing it for so long that I bet eventually Rutile stopped thinking of Padparacha as someone they cared for and someone they want to see, and instead thought of it as a puzzle to crack. Their obsession was to bring, Ru not Rutile, Padparacha back, not because they wanted their friend back, but because they wanted to solve the puzzle. And it's kind of distressing to see the amount of time that had to happen for that to take place, because we don't know how long Rutile has been working on this, a really long time, probably over a thousand years. and. It's, I think it shows like the decay of time too, because Rutile didn't even seem that disappointed to not spend that much time with Pad Paracha in the time that we see Pad Paracha awake. So it kind of indicated to me that Rutile sees Pad Paracha as an obsession, thing to observe. And I don't think it started like that. I don't think it started with those intentions, but because at the time that takes so long, it became an obsession to solve Pad Paracha and not to see them again. And the first thing that Rutile says when Pod Prasha wakes up is how much they've accomplished, how long it took them, all numbers and data and facts and stuff that shouldn't matter in the grand scheme of things because you finally have your friend woken up and don't you want to spend time with them? But instead, Rutile is stuck talking about their accomplishments and what they've done because that's what Rutile values. And what the characters talk about is what they value, and it's really interesting. In contrast, Pad Prasha really does care about Rutile. I mean, Pad Paracha is the closest character to doing nothing wrong in the series, and we can see that Pad Paracha has a true, genuine care for Rutile and the fact that they would rather them stop overworking themselves for them, even though it is a sign of them caring so much about Pad Paracha. And I wonder if Pad Paracha, like, kind of knew deep down that something had changed in Rutile to where it's become an obsession. And I think their talk with Foss is their desire for Rutile to stop being so obsessed. There's so much to unpack. There's so many layers to their relationship, and I love that. And I love that it, on the surface, Rutile's relationship with Pod Pro seems really caring until that purpose is taken away. Because Rutile was, uh, not Rutile, Paparacha was Rutile's entire purpose. Everything that they had ever worked towards. And once Foss took that away from them, they became a shell of themselves. And they didn't even want to become a doctor, because that was one of the things that was the craziest thing, is because the reason that Rutile didn't go to the moon with Foss is because they're like, oh, I need to be a doctor, I need to be here for the other gems. Like, something that a caring person would say, but what they really wanted was to stay with Paparasha. But then when Paparasha was taken without their will, they just, they stopped being their doctor. Like, they stopped putting on the lab coat, they stopped, um, helping the other gems they just sit there for who knows how many years i think over 200 uh staring at paparazzi's body instead of contributing to society because they're just so angry with, at foss for doing that and they can't forgive paparazzi for leaving even though it wasn't paparazzi's choice they just see paparazzi as a puzzle something to solve and they're so mad that someone took that solution away from them and it's so crazy that that's how their relationship ended basically and then it began again on the moon and i think that's because they decided on the moon to forget all about their past and things that they wanted to do so i think that they were able to move on from that because they just decided to not talk about it and forget about it i think but pot Paracha and rutel are the prime example of a ship that seems really good and happy and nice at the beginning that just completely decimates i mean it's like that with every single foss ship 
But the way Rutile just implodes when Pod Pronto leaves and when Pod Pronto is finally there, they are just so mad that they won't do anything. That's also one of the great things that Ichigawa does. Like, there's no dialogue, really, between, like, there's barely any dialogue between Pet and Rutile at that moment. And they barely get to talk with one another and a few gems talk about it. But, oh man, you, the visuals, the fact that Rutile is just sitting there for years holding basically Pad Paracha's heart and refuses to give it to them. Oh, it's so good just with how much can be interpreted through that scene. Just like, is it anger? Is it hatred? Is it something more? Is it love? Is it actually love? And they just are so distraught and are doing it out of love because if they revived Paparaja now, they would be beating them. I don't know, honestly. Like, their relationship, like, it's so small and subtle, the, the pages that just turn their relationship to out of their ash, but it's really interesting to think about. Like, did they actually love each other? Did they actually care for each other? Um, or was it all just an act? Was it fake? Was was there love in something else that they valued in the other person, but it wasn't for the person themselves? There's so much to interpret about Rutile and Pad the relationship. Let me know in the comments what you think about the relationship. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear your views of if it's still a really nice relationship. Did the later arcs ruin their relationship for you? And let me know what you think about all the other ships too. Are these ships something that you ship? Are they, do they all get decimated in your mind as well? Uh, can you defend these ships, whichever ships you are? And what other ships that I haven't mentioned because there's so many characters that you also think deserve to be on this list or ones that are bad or something along those lines. And that's all the ships, guys. Uh, none of them become canon. That's totally, totally all the ships. There's nothing else more. There's nothing cursed about any of the ships that get together. Okay, fine. We have to talk about it. We have to talk about Karen Gorman Acmea. <laughs> Let him leave the wars for last. I haven't seen a single... Uh, actually, that's a lie. Uh, I have seen very few, a very few minority actually like Acmea and Karen Gorman's relationship, but the majority of people absolutely hate it. <laughs> When I was first passively reading Hoseki no Kuni, I, on the surface, it seems okay, fine. I still thought that Acmea was like kind of weird and creepy, but I didn't think that the relationship was a bad thing or a bad thing for Karen Gorm in general. But upon a reread and upon thinking about it more, I was like, oh no, that ship is awful. <laughs> um, so cursed, so bad. Um, the more you think about it, the worse it gets. That could just be a tagline for Hoseki no Kuni in general. The more you think about it, the worse it gets. But um, the bad thing about Karen Gorm and Acme's relationship, and I'll probably mention this in other videos too, is that I've heard people say this, is that it really mimics like a grooming relationship. And of course you think like in a world where the youngest character is like 70, um, <laughs> that a grooming relationship really can't happen, but it really does like give all the signs of like really icky grooming manipulative relationship. And if Karen Gorm's whole character just makes it so much worse, because I already talked about how Karen Gorm has basically been manipulated their entire life since they were born from Ghost to Lapis to Foss and now to Acmea. And Acmea has made them think that they're choosing it for themselves, but they're not. And I think that it really shows the like ties of like the manipulation that Karen Gorm has been through. And the thing is that we really don't know if Karen Gorm's really happy like this. We really don't know if this is Karen Gorm's true self because it's been molded by what Acmea wants. It's kind of interesting because if you think about it, we see that Acmea gives Karen Gorm, in quotes, like, free choice, but Karen, but the opt-ins are always steered in Acmea's favor, which is a very, like, manipulative tactic, you know, because Acmea will give them the choices, but who gave the options for those choices, Acmea, and Acmea always props up the one that he wants uh, over the others. Like, he gave uh, Karen Gorm an ultimatum when the Karen Gorm turned into Moon Karen Gorm that people don't like. Karen Gorm had two choices, get rid of Ghost or stay as they were. And if you look at that scene, like, Acmea's words are very calculated, and Ichikawa chooses this for every character. All the words that every character says are really calculated. The reason why Ghost probably acts so violently towards Karen Gorm afterwards is because Ghost can tell that Acmea is taking Ghost control away from Karen Gorm, but it's not Karen Gorm gaining control, it's Acmea gaining control of Karen Gorm. Because Acmea phrased the choices in a way that made staying with Ghost sound awful and made getting rid of Ghost better, but also Acmea really pushed it in the way of like, you will follow me now, sort of, without saying that verbatim. And Karen Gorm wasn't the one who made that choice, it was Acmea. 
because uh, those are the only two choices that Acmea gave them. Acmea didn't say like, oh, you could try to live with Ghost or maybe you could have a conversation with Ghost. Uh, it was just get rid of Ghost and follow me or stay with Ghost and implying that it would be miserable to stay with them. And of course, we as the audience first see it that way because Ghost retaliates so much and that's because Ghost doesn't get a say in this at all. Like I said, I'm probably going to make multiple videos on how their relationship is just awful, but that's the gist of it is that Acme is in full control of the relationship, and we don't know if Karen Gorm is actually being their true self because the options that Acme gives them is all shaped by what he wants. And it's the complete opposite of what Foss wants. And people like Foss felt so betrayed by this. We felt so betrayed by this because it, eh, Karen Gorm really did a complete 180 on what their personality was, and that was intentional. What Acmea wanted was the complete opposite of what Foss wanted because he wanted to separate Karen Gorm and Foss as much as possible. Uh, also a bit of like just in general what he wanted in a partner as well, but he really persuades Karen Gorm to be the exact opposite of what Foss needed because, uh, you know, his, his manipulation of Foss, uh, but it also just shows how malleable Karen Gorm is, if that makes sense. And that's one of the reasons why we call it a grooming relationship when someone does that to a child, because a child doesn't really understand who they are yet or what they need or something to do. And Karen Gorm is the closest thing to a child in this universe by the fact that they have always had someone coddle them and teach them and direct them and where they need to go. And so now Acne is doing that, but he's doing that in a bad way not in a sibling relationship like they had with sort of the other characters with Ghost and Lapis and stuff, but now he's doing it as an authority figure and as someone who knows more and Karen Gorm is in a different place. It just gives all the grooming vibes. <laughs> Once I started to understand that about the relationship, I didn't hate Karen Gorm as much. I see Karen Gorm as an incredibly flawed character and they are so well written and probably one of the most complex characters in the series. But anyway, the terribleness of their relationship is sort of self-explanatory, but subtle enough that if you're just kind of passively reading, you don't pick up on it. But once you start thinking about it more, you're like, you know, his creepiness has kind of turned into even worse, uh, simply by the fact of the situation with Karen Gorm and the reasons he did it for. Because he only really approached Karen Gorm to progress Foss. It wasn't out of care for Karen Gorm, it was out of getting what he needed to get to nothingness, and that was ruining their relationship. And that's what Acme has done with all of Foss's relationships, uh, which is why the ships go so terribly. Uh, even with Padpa and Foss, which I don't know if that's a ship, but the reason why Acme uh, uh, had Padparacha sleep, and it has wasn't until Goshenite came over and revived them, uh, was because Padparacha would have 100% been there for Foss and would have helped them. We've seen them. That's how Padparacha is. And Padparacha was conveniently left unrevived for centuries uh, and not there to help Foss in any way uh, until it was needed for Padparacha. In short, uh, all the ships in Hoseki no Kuni are bad because Acmea sucks. Like the video if you agree. Thanks for watching.